Hi, and welcome to a very special 50th episode of the Breaking Bio Podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Before we get to our very special guest today, I'd like to introduce our other co-host for the episode. Hi, I'm Stephen Hamlin, postdoc at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Hi, I'm Tom Heisley. I'm a PhD student at the University of Stirling in Scotland. Like I said, we're lucky to be joined by acclaimed author David Quammen for this 50th episode of the Breaking Bio podcast. David Quammen is uh, an award-winning author who's written multiple nonfiction books and is also uh, published in National Geographic quite regularly. So, welcome to the podcast, David. Yeah. Hi, Morgan, Stephen, Tom. Hi, Breaking Bio. My name is David Quammen. I'm a science writer, uh, author of books about... Uh, mostly the life sciences. I also work for National Geographic and other magazines, um, traveling whenever possible to jungles, deserts, swamps, and remote places to spend time with field biologists. My usual journalistic beat is ecology, evolutionary biology, conservation biology, and I occasionally wade uh, trepidatiously into uh, molecular phylogenetics and some other things. That sounds a lot like my career. All right. <laughs> Except a lot more successful. Um. <laughs> hey! Hey! <laughs> All right, so it's going to be that kind of show. Older. Let's do this. <laughs> older, Morgan. That's the point. I'm much older. Oh. <laughs> All right. So there's hope for you yet, Stephen, I think, is where we're going with this. Yes. Um. <laughs> So, David, I, I'm so happy that you could be on the show because uh, I'm going to fanboy here and say that you're certainly one of my literary idols. Uh, I look up to your writing a lot and, and read it multiple times. I appreciate uh, that. Song of the Dodo is should be standard reading for, for anybody going into evolutionary biology, uh, in my view. So, uh, Thank you. Thanks, for, Morgan. Pretty much thanks for coming on. <laughs> ah, enjoy. stop gushing. I thought this I was going to be a hostile <laughs> interview. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Start asking the hard-hitting journalistic questions we're famous for. All right, so so you brought up the field work, uh, the amount of field work that you do, and I think it's kind of cool and, and amazing because I'm pretty sure you do more field work than most field biologists actually get to do. So you spend a lot of time actually out in crazy remote places. Um, you've written in most of your books about going through crazy field trips through tromping through the, the jungles of Africa or exploring uh, vast unexplored regions of, of Russia. I think you just got back from northern Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how did you get into so much hardcore field work that, that a lot of biologists would, would kill to try and get into as well? Well, uh, you're right that I, I have this privilege of spending a lot of time out in the field with biologists. And it's, for me, it's literary legwork and research. They're the ones who are doing the biology. I'm just following them around uh, and watching what they do and ask, pestering them with a lot of questions. Uh, but it's wonderful for me because... I get the variety that most professional biologists don't get. Somebody can be working on a project in, I don't know, in uh, the Northern Territory of Australia and spend years and years studying saltwater crocodiles or something, and that's fascinating work. Um, I might get to drop in on them and spend two weeks out there capturing crocodiles and tagging crocodiles with them, and then, and then a month later I'm going to the Congo with a biologist who's studying gorillas, or a month after that I'm going to um, the Russian Arctic with somebody who's looking at polar bears. So I get, in a sense, I get the best of both worlds. I, I, get, to, I get to see this wonderful, amazing work going on in these remote, difficult places, but I also get to bounce around between subjects and between scientists. I don't know if I spend more time in the field than actual field biologists. I doubt that I do, but um, but I get to talk, I get to move among them and among you and and hear about, uh, hear firsthand about the work that a number of different scientists are doing. And so sometimes when I meet scientists in the field, they say, oh, hey, you've been, you've been in the field with uh, so-and-so? Really great. Tell me what she's doing or tell me what he's doing. And, and they envy, envy me that variety. It's good that I have the variety because I don't have the patience to be an actual uh, field biologist. I couldn't sit in the same forest um, being rained on for three years with a pair of binoculars watching um, animal C groom animal D. I just I don't have the patience for that. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> 
<laughs> different <laughs> strokes of biology for different folks. Yeah, that's, very that's why I sit behind a computer. <laughs> <laughs> None of this nature stuff for me. So are there any any of these field excursions that stand out in your mind as, as being uh, your top trip, something that uh, you enjoyed, whether you know academically or, or um, from the experience of it or, or just from the natural wonders that you managed to see above any of the others? Well, it's hard to choose. Some, I mean, it's always a thrill to go to Madagascar. I love going to Australia. I mentioned the Northern Territory. I love going to the Northern Territory. Um, uh, I love going to the Amazon. But probably, if one of these opportunities stands out above the rest, it's uh, it's doing large sections of uh, a uh, biological survey hike across the Congo Basin in 1999 and 2000 with a a wonderfully crazed, hard-bitten uh, biologist, ecologist, conservationist named Mike Fay, J. Michael Fay. Uh, this was a project that was called the Mega Transect. He literally walked 2,000 miles through the last remaining pristine forests of, of Central Africa, and that included the Congo Basin and then the Ogue River Basin in Gabon. Took him 456 days. He did this entire walk in a pair of river sandals and uh, I think it was Tiva river sandals and Patagonia river shorts um, with a GPS and a crew of African fellows helping him carry food and tents and computers uh, and um, a whole series of write in the rain notebooks in which he was keeping track of what he saw and I got uh, I was asked to cover that for National Geographic to write a series of three stories about it. They ran under the under the rubric the Mega Transect series in 2000 and 2001. And I got to walk about, oh, I think a total of about eight weeks with him, broken into four two-week sections. So I would fly in and join him, come in by helicopter or come in by dugout canoe or come in by bush plane and join him at one of his resupply points and then take off through the jungle with him. I also was wearing Tiva sandals and river shorts because I learned that was the only way you could go where he was going. And sometimes you're up to here in muddy water. Uh, and, and, uh, and then I wrote this nice story for National Geographic. What? I said sandals is what you want to wear when you're wandering through who knows what in the muddy river. That's sandals and shorts because you always know where you stand. You know, you don't have leeches hiding in your, in your Wellington boots and in your long pants. <laughs> You can always look down and know exactly what situation you're in and pick the leashes off your toes. So that was that was a one in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, it was physically very hard, um, but it was really satisfying and very interesting. Mike Fay, like a lot of field biologists, is admirable to me because he's physically tough and he's intellectually tough, and that's what draws me to field biology and the people who do it. That combination, it's just great. I've said somewhere in the introduction to one of my books, the, I think the little Darwin biography, I've said that you know, I, I was attracted to Darwin, first of all, because he was a field biologist. And I admire field biologists. Some people admire medical missionaries. Some people admire astronauts or, or cowboys. I admire field biologists, and I love to spend time with them. So I wanted to know how, how you actually got into covering the sort of field biology beat, as you put it, because I think I'm right in saying that you were not always a nonfiction writer. That's right, Tom. Yeah, I was. I started as a novelist. I started as a fiction writer. Um, first few books that I published were were fiction. I even published a couple of spy novels in the in the 1980s. Uh, but then I discovered a that uh, I was really much more interested in the world and the people who who do things like field biology. Uh, I was interested in the, the world of fact, the world of science and science history. And I, you know, I was a middle-class white male from the American Midwest. I realized that the world did not need me to be a novelist. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I started writing about what other people do, what you guys do, what you know, what what um, theoretical ecologists do, and um, and uh, mathematical mathematically modeling ecologists and field biologists, and, and uh, it uh, it became the canvas that um, that I I put my work on. 
Um, and that happened sort of by a gradual process during the 1970s and early 80s. I drifted away from fiction writing and drifted into nonfiction focused on the life sciences. Uh, I should say that I'm, I'm a science journalist despite the fact that I have no academic training whatsoever in science, but then again I have no training whatsoever in journalism. It's all been, it's all been uh, um, you know, sort of self-training, on-the-job training, teaching myself, trial and error with lots of error. You know, that's actually a, a good point to follow up on. I, I really want to get into spillover, but we talk a lot here about you know alternative uh, endpoints for people studying science or you know, other ways you know, ways to improve science communication. And I'm wondering if people are interested in getting into the kind of things you're doing, nonfiction writing on science, narrative writing. What kind of tips do you have for them to take those steps to move into the type of work you do? I guess the first tip I would offer is don't do it the way I did it because it's such a roundabout route. Um, yeah, I did my graduate work on William Faulkner and I don't regret that. I loved and do love William Faulkner but it, it was sort of peculiar um, roundabout training to become a, a a science journalist and a, and a non-fiction author of scientific subjects. Um, for people who want to be science writers, uh, I would say it's if you want to be an imaginative, creative writer who works in non-fiction, then it's still really important to read read great writers, read Faulkner or, or read uh, oh, Lauren Isley or read J.B.S. Haldane or read Horace Freeland Judson read Matt Ridley, read Richard Dawkins, read John McPhee, read Ed Abbey, read Annie Dillard, and then write, 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 practice a lot, um, blog. Nowadays people can blog. You, you know, there are no rejection slips in a sense anymore. Everybody can be a public writer um, by, um, by creating a blog for himself or herself. And uh, I'm not much of a blogger myself, but I think that it's a very valuable channel for young writers starting out or aspiring writers to begin trying to connect with an audience. So, so read, 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 write, 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 and, and get out into the world and learn about people's jobs. Um, and maybe do a degree, uh, do a degree in science if you want to be a science journalism journalist. Unlike myself, I never did a degree in science. Uh, would I say do a degree in writing, in nonfiction writing, and creative writing? No, I'd say don't bother with that. Just just learn it. You know, cre freelance writing is a is a profession for autodidacts. So if you can't teach yourself how to do it, you're probably not cut out for it anyway. Fair point. So you you obviously have very varied interests in the life sciences, but you also said that you have no uh, formal scientific training. I was just wondering, you obviously read a lot of the primary literature, so uh, my question is in two parts. Um, how do you choose what to read, and what, in your opinion, makes a good readable scientific paper? Well, you're right, uh, Tom, that I read a lot of the professional literature. I read a lot of journal articles, and I you know, sometimes I spend whole days reading journal articles, and that's something that's a, that's again a luxury that most scientists don't have. They're working on their own science. They're trying to keep up with the literature at the same time. But I re read and reread and reread um, scientific journal articles, and uh, how do I get interested in the subject? I don't know. I hear about something, I see a little item in the newspaper or online that catches my attention. You know, somebody has cloned a white-tailed deer and is claiming that this may have implications for endangered species work. And I say to myself, wait a minute, that's crazy. Um, how does cloning help with endangered species? You can clone an individual, but you can't clone a genetically diverse population back into existence. So I get interested in that, and I start looking for scientific art articles on that subject. Maybe something has just been published on that. I read that journal article and then I go back through the literature cited and I you know, I highlight three or four articles that might lead me uh, deeper into the subject and 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 so I essentially trace usually trace my way backwards in time through interesting journal articles to the literature cited and from those cited articles to articles that they cite 
and I, I like to pick up the thread not just about how an idea or a scientific field has developed, but how it's developed through time, the history of the development of it. Even if that only means the history over 12 years or something like that. It can be very, very interesting. Um, anyway, that's, that's the sort of thing that, that guides my reading. You know, hang on just a second and let me show you an example of this. <laughs> For anybody listening to the podcast who's not watching, you, you must understand that, that David's sitting in a massive library right now um, that's pretty much the, the envy of anybody who enjoys a good book or a good read. <laughs> um, uh, let's see if I can do this. Is this going to work? Sure. Uh, no. Right back up a little bit. Back up a little bit. There you go. I can't get it centered. <laughs> oh, well. It the, was reservoir, the reservoir is a pandemic and non-pandemic HIV one. Yeah. Chimpanzee uh, reservoir. Brandon Keel et al. Uh, Beatrice Hahn is the uh, senior author, published in Science in 2006. Uh, it was one of the things that was very important for my uh, research on spillover. This was the... Um, this was a scientific article that essentially said, um, using molecular phylogenetics, we have found where the original spillover of the pandemic strain of HIV occurred. And it occurred in the southeastern cam corner of Cameroon in Central Africa. So I read this paper about six years ago, and I said, holy crap. <laughs> um, this is really, really interesting. And I read it again, I read it again, I always, um, I make marks on a, on a paper each time I read it. Um, I, essentially, I date each reading of it and over a period of time. It's not unusual for me to read a paper four or five times and see different things in it each time. Uh, and one of the things that I saw in this paper was that this um, location in space of the original crucial spillover of the pandemic strain of HIV in southeastern Cameroon, there's an inset map in this article. And I looked at that inset map and I said, I've been there. I've been very close to that place. I went right up that river on the way to this megatransect operation, this expedition that I told you about. I, I went up a river in Central Africa called, called the Sangha River to a place called Bomasa. And it turns out that Bomasa in the Republic of Congo is just across the river from this area of southeastern Cameroon where um, the original spillover of HIV occurred. So I got very interested in that and I said, oh, I've got to go back there. And eventually I did go back there and, and retraced the probable route of, of HIV having passed, having spilled over from one chimpanzee into one human, um, the route that it probably took downriver out of southeastern Cameroon to the big population centers of Central Africa, Brazzaville, and what in, in those days was Leopoldville, capital of the Belgian Congo. All right, Don't get so, me started on that. <laughs> well, no, I think we are, because I'm, I'm going to hijack this, and we're going to talk about spillover, because I study viruses, and to hell with these guys. Um, okay. <laughs> so, but for the audience who doesn't know, can you... So, Spillover is a book essentially about zoonotic diseases. Um, can you kind of just recap the book quickly for people who haven't read it, and then we'll We'll get into some uh, talk about it. Quickly recap the 592 pages, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, if you could do that up in about 140 characters, that'd be great. Okay, all right. Uh, Spillover is a book about emerging diseases and where they emerge from. And where they usually emerge from is other species, animals. That means we're talking about the category of zoonotic diseases, diseases that pass from non-human species into humans, take hold in us, cause new diseases. It includes some of the nastiest old ones, like bubonic plague, and some of the nastiest new ones, like bird flu and AIDS, and a lot of other really dramatic diseases, like Ebola virus disease, and some things called Hendra virus in Australia, Nipah virus in Malaysia and Bangladesh, SARS, which came out of southern China, and, uh, and the next big one, whatever that may prove to be. Uh, and that's what the book is about. It, and I, I, it's a book of uh, book of history and travel and character portraits as well as a book of science. Um, and um, I say sometimes 
uh, that uh, it's even got maybe, I hope, a little bit of humor in it. I probably shouldn't say this. Uh, it's, it's not a very funny book, but I hope it might be the funniest book you ever read about Ebola. <laughs> Actually, I assume that bar is pretty low. So, <laughs> but I, as soon as I say that, I realize too that I have to I have to apologize because Ebola because I, you know, I've I know enough about what a horrible disease Ebola is and and the people it's killed in Central Africa, mostly poor Africans living in villages with very little access to health care, uh, which is why it's been so horrible for them. So, you know, every subject admits of a little bit of humor, but I say that realizing that, you know, it's a, it's a gruesome disease that punishes poor Africans, and therefore mm. it's to be taken seriously. Well, Could you actually quickly recount the story of how Ebola got started? Because I heard you uh, tell it at uh, the evolution meeting last year when you gave a, a really fantastic talk. Oh, in, uh, uh, in Ottawa? You were there, yeah. Tom? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, did I talk about how Ebola got going, or did I talk about how I got interested in this? With the thing about the thirteen dead gorillas in a pile. Yeah, you talked about that, and then it was um, you talked about how some kids pretended that they'd killed. Yes, an animal yes, for me. Yes, that was a particular outbreak that I, I happened to be important to me, and it's part of my book because I, I walked through that area when I was on this mega trans. Transect with Mike Fay. It was a famous outbreak in 1996. It wasn't the first Ebola outbreak. That was in 1976. But in 1996, Ebola struck a little village um, in that area that I was just describing on the upper. Um, no, excuse me. It was a, it was a little bit west of there. It was on the upper Evindo River in northeastern Gabon, and um, people started getting sick. What happened first was that some boys went out hunting for meat and they came back with a chimpanzee, a dead chimpanzee, and they said, hooray, we're great successful hunters. Everybody in the village said, great, we have some protein. They butchered and ate the chimpanzee, which is, you know, chimpanzee is not uncommonly eaten in those, those corners of Central Africa. And then people started getting sick, uh, started getting terribly sick. Um, they were evacuated downriver to a provincial hospital. Eventually, about 32 people died, which is something like 80 or 90 percent of the people who got sick. Um, and uh, everybody who who ate of the um, the dead chimpanzee got sick. Um, then um, an international response team went into that village and they did some epidemiology and some molecular work, and they found that it, uh, Ebola was the disease and that um, the uh, chimpanzee that the boys had brought in, they had not killed it in the forest. They had found it dead in the forest, and it was presumably hot with Ebola, and so that's how the, the outbreak got started in that particular village. Uh, but then once they got it into the provincial hospital and they knew what it was, they knew it was Ebola, then uh, relatively simple barrier nursing methods, you know, latex gloves and masks and confinement of um, fluids and, and elimination of traditional burial rituals that involved cleaning the body by hand. Once they took care of all those things and eliminated those risk factors, then they stopped the outbreak, and that's generally true of Ebola. It's not as transmissible as something like SARS or influenza. It's not a respiratory ailment, at least so far it has not been. So. That's one of the reasons it's really never gotten out of Africa, uh, because it can be controlled with these relatively simple barrier nursing methods. But until it's, so, until it's controlled, it's a, it's a horrific disease. So not like in Hollywood, where you know one person gets Ebola and then half of Africa dies. Not like in Hollywood, no. Not at all like in Hollywood. For instance, in the movie Outbreak, that's the one mm. with um, Morgan Freeman and uh, um, Dustin Hoffman. Probably from about fifteen or twenty years ago. I love uh, that movie. <laughs> a bad, a bad script. Oh, come on, Stephen. A bad script with some great actors in it. But one of the one of the registers of the level of credibility of that um, that movie is that the African monkey that escapes carrying this nasty virus escapes somewhere in California. The African monkey is played by a South American monkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, to be fair, I was. <laughs> I was like 15 when I saw it, but I uh, movie that actually, on the other hand, 
uh, the movie Contagion, more recently made by Steven Soderbergh, is very good on the scientific side. Mm. Uh, it's based on, uh, based somewhat loosely on Nipah virus um, disease, uh, and the scientific consultants on it, uh, Ian Lipkin and I think John Epstein, are some of the sources, uh, the, the most reliable expert sources on, on these emerging viruses, and in particular that one. So they mm -hmm. kept, uh, they kept the movie. Um, scientifically plausible. You've actually mentioned that. I mean, can, uh, Outbreak is, I mean, you're right. In hindsight, it's a terrible movie, but uh, you've mentioned that even the poor depictions of things like Ebola can get people interested in this, like the Hot Zone book. Yeah. Like the Hot Zone. The Hot Zone, yeah, I, I, I criticized that or I, I, I second-guessed it a little bit in my book because the Ebola experts that I've talked to since the Hot Zone came out, including some of the same people who talked to Richard Preston have told me, no, no, it's not, it's a horrible disease, but it's not as as bloody as it's portrayed in that book. It's, um, it doesn't cause people to melt down. It doesn't cause internal organs to liquefy. It doesn't need to do that to be a, a horrifying and highly lethal uh, disease. But still, um, you know, I read the original Hot Zone articles when they ran in the New Yorker. It was mes they were mesmerizing to me. I was fascinated. That's part of what got me interested. And I've talked to people who are professional Ebola researchers and who work in this field. And uh, one one woman who who works on Ebola vaccines told me that when she was a teenager, her words, she said, "I was a hot, I was a Hot Zone kid." She read that book and it made her interested in the field. And um, and so she went into that field. So it uh, it it misled people about certain things in connection with Ebola, but it did some good things too. Hmm. You know, Spillover is such a wide-ranging book. Like you're you're all over the world. You're everything from you know uh, looking at Hendra in Australia to Ebola in Africa, and you're trekking through caves in China. All the stuff you did in that book. Was there ever a point where you you looked around and thought? Oh my God! I I could die here. Like, you know. Um, yes, although I say that with the realization that um, when you go to Central Africa or when you go to Southern China, um, you go to these places. Probably the two most dangerous things you do are get into an old taxi cab to come in from the international airport, <laughs> a taxi cab that has no seatbelt, <laughs> or get into a Cessna. 182 to fly over the forest to fly into somebody's field camp. If you survive those two things and then you go climbing into a cave wearing personal protective gear with a scientist who knows what he or she is doing, um, you haven't survived all the possible risks, but you know you've you've survived some of the more major ones. There was a point though when I was in a cave in southern China with a researcher named Alexei Kimura, wonderful fellow from EcoHealth Alliance, and. I was with him to watch him and to, to some extent to help him uh, and his colleagues, his Chinese colleagues, trap bats to take blood samples to look for SARS, the SARS virus, SARS coronavirus, another really, really lethal and transmissible virus. So we're in this tight little cave. We've crawled through some holes to get down into it, and we're in this open room, and these little bats are flying all around us, and, and we've spread a net over the opening that we came through so that the bats are trying to escape us, and they're getting caught in the net trying to go out. And we're, you know, Alexei and his colleagues are collecting them and taking them out of the net and putting them into pillowcases and handing the pillowcases to me. And uh, and we're not wearing masks. We're not wearing goggles. We're not wearing. Uh, we might have been wearing latex gloves. I think we probably were. Um, and I asked Alexei. Um, how come? <laughs> because when I've gone out with other scientists in those situations, we were pretty well covered with um, with PPE, personal protective equipment. And Alexi said, "Well, you know, you just have to make your choices, and and sometimes it's difficult to operate with all that protective gear." Um, this is in the book, and and essentially he used the um, the uh, the the taxi cab without a seatbelt analogy on me, and to explain what his philosophy was of this whole thing. In some circumstances where you know that the virus is present, it's really important to wear a lot of um, protection. If you don't know whether the virus is present, you think it might be present, and you're casting your net 
broadly, then in some cases uh, you're not wearing protection. Anyway, I, I was never I was never trembling because I trusted these scientists. So I figured I'll I'll do whatever they're doing, wear whatever protection they're wearing, and then I'll stand three feet behind them and hope that they don't hand me any really large bats um, that are struggling with claws and teeth um, and, and carrying a lethal virus. That's probably a good strategy to have at, at all times. Be the fastest runner in front of the cheetah, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that whole thing about being a faster runner than your buddy, you know, they say, oh, you can't run faster than a grizzly bear. And the other guy says, I, you know, I don't have to run faster than a grizzly bear. I only have to run faster than you. <laughs> I found myself in exactly and literally that situation in northern Africa one time on an assignment, in, in northern Kenya on an assignment uh, involving um, elephants with a wonderful elephant biologist named Ian Douglas Hamilton. And we got charged by a very angry female elephant, and we both took off running. And... Um, <laughs> Fortunately for me, he gave me a head start, and, and the, elephant, the elephant caught him and picked him up and threw him, and then almost killed him with her tusks. Uh, but she missed him. Um, Holy. Wow! <laughs> and then he dusted himself off and said, "Shall we go back and have a cup of tea?" <laughs> <laughs> wow! Pretty intense. I was thinking I I went through something similar with. Uh, Doug Futuma when he and I were looking at birds and we got chased by a capricaylee, but it it didn't catch us and uh, it certainly couldn't have thrown us against a wall. <laughs> Did you run faster or Doug Futuma run faster? <laughs> you know, given that he's in his 60s, I'm going to hopefully <laughs> say that I ran faster. <laughs> now, that's why I, I, I have great respect for Doug Futuma. He's a wonderful biologist and a nice guy, but that's why I, I you know, I'm in my 60s too. That's why I try and stay fit is because I go out into the field with young field biologists and I want to be able to keep up with them. But then if we ever get chased by a lion or a grizzly bear or an elephant, I don't necessarily want to be the one who is left behind. I want to be able to keep up. <laughs> uh, I did still have that slight feeling of awe where I was like, I can't overtake Doug Fatuma. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a trouble if you got him killed. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. My but career would be not finished by a before it even started. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be really awkward at your PhD defense that the US would die by Capricorn. <laughs> <laughs>